So the sponsor for this event is TPF Technology. Uh, they are a IT outsourcing company located in India. And uh, my company at the startup happened to use them. And uh, so if you want to talk about that after the talk, I can tell you more about them and what they do and how they do it. Uh, having said that, now we can move to the event itself. Um, so the speaker for today, uh, Anatomy of the Cloud Computing Deals, is uh, Jokin Gamboa, who is a partner in LB3. And uh, he focuses on large enterprises uh, for structuring deals in cloud computing. And uh, you can read more about it on the website. And I will uh, let him tell you about himself um, as it pertains to the topic. Um, and let's uh, get on with it. Please welcome uh, Jokin Gamble. Thank you, Manoj. Thank you for coming out. I'm impressed that he told you I was a lawyer and you're still out here on the rainy night <laughs> uh, to listen to what I have to say. Um, as Manoj mentioned, I'm a partner in LB3. LB3 is a boutique law firm that generally represents very large users in technology deals, telecom deals. Uh, so most of the work we do is on behalf of Fortune 100, that sort of thing. But my background, I started, we were talking earlier, in the Silicon Valley, did all the work on behalf of startups, and went and started a venture fund, worked with a startup for a number of years. Uh, which was an ASP, what we used to call SaaS company, so I've been in technology uh, my whole career. Great to be here tonight. Everybody here is in technology, either at a tech company or in technology at a non-tech company, no? Yeah. And I don't know anything about any of your backgrounds, so I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of where you guys are coming from. It might help me to... Partner in a small strategy consulting firm. Okay, great. Dealing with um, commercial mortgage finance companies. Okay. I actually work independently, but for two separate companies. Who one is doing um, designing sustainability higher education resources, and they're trying to use um, basically web platform internationally, like a social networking format, to right. facilitate that. And the other is a, a virtual uh, classroom platform. And so I'm doing business development for them. And there are some issues such as um, creative licensing and right. creative commons that I'm curious about. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we'll touch on those, but uh, interrupt me anytime. It's, it's good that it's a small group. Please make this a conversation to the extent you can. Um, if your neighbor starts falling asleep, just nudge him uh, or her. I, the agenda, we'll start with an overview of cloud computing, and the reason, we do, the reason I like to do that is because cloud has a lot of hype right now, and so everything is cloud. Right? Everything that anybody sells is cloud. So. It, from my perspective, it helps to kind of get on the same page in terms of what it is that we're talking about. Once we do that, then we can talk about how an, a user of cloud services, <coughs> certainly you guys, but I think pretty much anybody now will be, is using or will be using cloud services in some form or another, how you would approach that, what, what sorts of things you should be thinking about, if you're going to do a cloud deal, you know, what you should be putting into your contract, that sort of thing, closing thoughts, questions at the, at the end. But again, as I said, uh, please do. Uh, interrupt at any time, ask questions, make comments, steer us in, in a different direction. Uh, so what is cloud computing? I, like I said, everything now is cloud computing, right? And this wasn't actually the case about 12 months ago, two years ago, nothing was cloud computing. Now anything that anybody sells is cloud. Uh, when I talk about cloud computing, it's really what can be re referred to as public cloud computing, but that is there is a vendor that owns, runs, manages computing resources. They've got the whole thing. You as a user are going to access that via some IP network, maybe it's the public internet, maybe it's some sort of private network, but they've got, they've got all the computing resources, they're theirs, you're accessing and using those via the cloud or some private network. Uh, they're designed on a virtualized platform, this is the difference between the ASP I was at and SaaS now and really why cloud has been able to take off, right, and that is because cloud vendors have been able to build this virtualization layer which basically enables them to save a whole lot of money because they're able to share the underlying computing resources among a whole lot of different uh, clients. That also happens to be the reason why cloud is, I call it more dangerous or more concerning than having your own private computing systems. Um, cloud, true cloud is highly elastic and scalable. So it can grow with you, but it can not only grow with you, it can shrink with you, right? So in the legacy computing model, 
if you had, if you were a retailer, for example, and you have a huge amount of use in November, December, you have to build the peak. You have to run the peak. It's very expensive, and you're running the peak all year long at some level or another. You're at least buying the peak. In a cloud model, the whole idea is you buy and you pay for what you're going to use. And if you're a retailer, in the example that, you get, that I gave, you have, you know, 10 virtual servers all year long, and then maybe November, December, you have 30. But the idea is you have the flexibility to go up and down as you need those resources, then of course, you pay for what you use. So you're not locked into uh, getting space in a data center, buying a bunch of boxes, licensing a bunch of OS, putting a bunch of software on top of that, all of which you're buying, running, buying, building, and running to peak. But you, again, you pay for what you use. You pay, you pay by the drink, right? Like electricity is the analogy people uh, like to like to make. Uh, different versions of cloud computing, SaaS, PaaS, a colleague of mine likes to call the last one IaaS. <laughs> I tend to just refer to it as infrastructure as a service. Software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. With infrastructure as a service, it's important to keep in mind some vendors like to call it computing as a service. But in any event, these are really kind of the three layers, and it helps to think through who the users are. The ultimate customer of each of these different versions of cloud computing to really kind of get them straight. At the bottom layer, it's infrastructure as a service. The client is your network architect. This is basically your data center, right? So now instead of running boxes with an OS and some storage in your own data center, you're accessing that computing power via the cloud. At the other end is software as a service. The end user are end users. We're all familiar with this because we've been using Yahoo Mail, Hotmail forever. SaaS is an entire computing solution provided on the other end of the cloud, you've got a thin client on your, end, on your end, everything else is on the other side. And in the middle, there's platform as a service. My clients tend to be much more focused on infrastructure as a service as a way to uh, basically get additional data, uh, data center space and software as a service. The middle layer of platform as a service is a lot more for, you know, if you and I, in fact, Jeremy would probably be something that you guys would use. If you and I are going to go start wine.com, Right? We're going to code, we're going to develop an application. We don't really want to bother with all the underlying computing stuff. We just kind of want it set up. We want something fully configured. We want to write our app on top of it. That's really platform as a service. So the clients for platform as a service are app developers, basically. Is that like Drupal? I'm sorry? Is that like a Drupal? There, and I, I don't know. It's, I mean, Google, like Amazon, a whole lot of folks have. Yeah, exactly. That you can code onto, right? You're basically developing your app on top of that. You don't really care about how many boxes they are, what OS there is. I mean, you're going to have to build based on what's there, but it's not something you want to concern yourself with. I, in terms of the various deployment models, again, when I talk about cloud computing, I'm talking about what's referred to as public cloud and every, everything that I've talked about until now. And it's important to get these, it's important to distinguish among these because depending on what, <laughs> depending on what it is that you're buying in the cloud, you're going to have entirely different concerns. Right? People like to talk about a private cloud as cloud computing. Private cloud is really just virtualizing your own computing resources. So you might have a data center, you virtualize your computing resources in that data center, people call that a private cloud. That's fine, you can name it whatever you want. But the concerns that you're gonna, that you're, that you're gonna be thinking about in running a private cloud are entirely different. It's, you know, most of what we talk about with the public cloud is really not an issue. You might run a private cloud in your data center, you might run it in some third party's data center. Someone else, in fact, might even manage that for you, but at the end of the day, a private cloud is a set of dedicated computing resources that only you use. And that's, again, that's really not, you know, when we're talking about a, a cloud, cloud, true cloud computing, it's a shared environment that you're accessing, right, from some uh, vendor that's managing, running, and then sharing it potentially among any number of users. Uh, what is becoming more popular, and frankly, I expect is gonna continue, uh, to be the case is what people are calling a hybrid cloud. And the idea is I'm going to use a public cloud for applications that are less sensitive, for data that's less sensitive. If I've, got, if I've got really sensitive data, if I've got a crucial application, then I'll run it in my own infrastructure, I'll run it in some private cloud. Basically kind of use the best of both worlds depending on what my use case is. People like to refer to that as a hybrid cloud. But again, what I'm talking about tonight is public cloud, true cloud computing. So why why use services in a cloud? Uh, beyond the fact that they're hyped, beyond the fact that now Apple even has a cloud solution, the fabulous iCloud, why would you go to the cloud? Well, if you're a technologist, 
And you, for example, have a set of clients. Maybe marketing comes to you and says, I want this new marketing app. Right? I'm going to run this new marketing app. Or the sales team says, I want to run this new CRM app. Right? In the legacy world, the first thing you do is you go get space in your data center. <coughs> then you go buy a bunch of boxes. And then you license the OS. And then you get storage. There's this huge, complex, expensive process you go through. And how long does it take from the time that, the, that your client came to talk to you to the time all those resources up, ready, and go. Right in the cloud, you can have all that done within 24 hours. In fact, if you're talking about all virtual servers, within hours, your client comes to you, says, I want to run this new app. You know, you go online through your portal, you've got all the resources up, ready, and running very, very quickly. So on the front end, you're saving a lot of time. You're saving money because, again, you're going to pay for what you use. Right? You don't have to buy a bunch of boxes and license a bunch of software. All you have to do is sign up a few virtual boxes depending on what it is that you think you're going to use right off the bat. If this, if this marketing, <coughs> excuse me, if this marketing person's app actually gets a lot of use, they just log into your portal and within hours have more virtual servers. So again, you're not, you're not spending a bunch of money on, you're not spending a bunch of money on the front end, right? There's no big expense that you have to make today. Um, as I just mentioned, that enables obviously a rapid transition to this new technology so you're no longer the bottleneck, right? The marketing department, the sales department isn't waiting for you for three months to get the computer resources, the computing re resources up and running. Overall, lower total cost of usage is certainly a promise of the cloud. Something to keep in mind here though, it's, it's very similar to uh, the promise of outsourcing. Everybody thought outsourcing was a fabulous idea uh, until they got into it and then everybody lost a lot of money. Cloud computing can save you a lot of money, but you have to understand your use case, right? If today you're running and building the peak, and then you go to a buy per sit model, you should save money. But that means you have to understand what your usage is actually going to be, and you then have to manage to that usage, right? If you go out and through the cloud, order a bunch of resources that aren't used, but are sitting there, you're going to be paying for them, right? If you mismanage how many ser what services you order or what you replace, Right? In fact, it may not be economically feasible. So you should be saving money, but it requires some thought and some, some process on the front end to make sure that you, that you actually do that. Um, as we talked about, it's much more scalable than a legacy model. It's not just scalable, it's not just going to grow with you, but it's elastic, which is even better. Right? Certainly if you're in retail, any number of other businesses, your computing resources are going to vary. If it's an HR app, it's probably you know, a couple months out of the year, it's going to get huge usage, the rest of the year much less usage. So you can buy what you need as opposed to buying a whole lot and having to run it year-round. Um, one of the uh, final bullets there, it is designed, right, by its very nature, cloud computing is designed for someone who is remote. So as more and more companies have remote workers, cloud computing tends to be a great solution. It's actually already designed to serve them. And the last couple bullets, really, the, the, the point of the last couple bullets is this. You'll hear from cloud vendors, and I think there's certainly truth to it, let them bother with what they're good at, right? Why, why have to run a bunch of upgrades on your systems? Why bother having to run your own data center? Let them do that. You focus on what you're really good at. You focus on improving the technology use in your organization, on getting the best app up. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about how that's different with cloud solutions versus just outsourcing co-location, things like that? You're absolutely right. It's, it's very, very similar. That's, I, in, that, in that regard, it's the same thing. What's interesting, though, in both cases is um, with outsourcing, and I'm sure you've seen this, I've seen this, where an organization, in fact, had a big hospitality client that thought, okay, you know, we're going to outsource everything, and they fired everybody. And that doesn't tend to work either because you still have to manage to it, right? Somebody has to still manage to what's supposed to happen and make sure that it happens and make sure that it happens, right? So either way, right, you're, you're still going to have folks that know what's going on and manage to it. In a cloud environment, what we've seen more and more of actually is uh, the purchasing of a management overlay. So for example, I've got a deal right now with Wipro who's going to be managing a client's Amazon uh, cloud environment, right? Which, I mean, it's kind of funny, a layer on top of layer. But in any event, at some point, you're going to have to have someone in your organization who knows what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, right? What the value is and manages to them. But you're, you're absolutely right. In that regard, it's the same thing, right? It's the same idea. Let the experts bother with what is uh, medial is the wrong term, but you know the basic computing stuff. You're going to focus on that high-level strategy. 
Well, in yeah. situations like this, what's the general time frame? I mean, are companies switching to this kind of model for a very short period? I mean, are they sort of changing their structure and changing their yeah. strategy for a short vision? I mean, do, I, do companies do this with like a 10-year strategic plan? You're talking about flat the users? Yeah, yeah, like switching their... Yeah, you know, one of the... So, you know, we'll get into that a little more later, but one of the great things about this <coughs> is that you can dabble, right? And so unlike other technologies where it takes a lot of investment, a lot of time, you can actually you know, sign up to use, and in fact, I'll come back to that, uh, you can sign up to use Amazon services with a credit card, right? You start dabbling right away. And so it enables you to check it out. It enables you to try it out. In fact, uh, one of the things that we've seen is, I, I, I had imagined that most of the Amazon's clients, cloud clients were startups, and I was out in Silicon Valley, everybody used them, so I just assumed that most of their revenue was coming from that space. And then I read something a few years ago that said, oh no, it's coming from large enterprises. Now if you talk to large enterprise procurement departments, legal departments, they have no idea that in fact, a bunch of folks in their organization are using Amazon Cloud. In fact, I was looking at uh, a smaller cloud management vendor's presentation on what it was that they're doing. And at the end, you know, in their list of key clients, they listed one of our clients. And I talked to a partner of mine who works for them. I said, oh, I, you know, did we do this deal? And he said, no. He called their AGC and the guy said, we don't have a deal with them. I said, well, not only do you have a deal with this provider, but you're one of their key clients. It's on their PowerPoint. Um, but that is what's actually currently happening. The benefit is, if you're an organization that wants to try it out, you can do that, right? You can kind of dabble. Uh, no, our clients are certainly not moving across the board to the cloud. In fact, right now, there's a lot of kind of trying things out slowly, right? And then those that are doing it, and, you know, the response to the cloud computing is kind of all over the place, right? Much like so many other technologies. You have folks that say, this is the greatest thing ever. Everything is going to be in the cloud. And then you have other folks that say, this is the scariest and worst thing ever. All our data is going to be lost. We should never go to the cloud. And the truth is probably somewhere in between, right? If you approach it thoughtfully, there are going to be certain use cases that really make sense in the cloud. And there are going to be others that really don't make sense. And then depending on uh, what space you're in, right, if you're a financial institution, healthcare institution, what have you, you know, you can have more or less sensitive data. But no, I don't know. I don't know any company that's just moving to the cloud. Certainly, startups are right. Yeah, and the value with two startups, and we're probably using like six different man like cloud management that's platforms and trying them out. We like some for some reasons because and don't like because others. it makes perfect sense, right? So you're starting to. That's the problem the VCs are having. They have nowhere to put their money because it doesn't cost anything to start a company, right? But the clients that I've got are massive companies that sometimes are. Uh, Say slow to move. Some of them faster than others, but certainly no one that's kind of getting up full throttle moving the cloud. Yeah. I thought the cloud computing was more like re or sharing the resource on the cloud. It's actually different from the outsource. Outsource, to me, it's actually totally different. It, you know, absolutely, they absolutely. I think his question was specific to the expertise that you're handing over to the provider, right? So, uh, when it comes to Management oh, okay. of boxes and updating boxes and basic OS software. Right. You're handing that over whether it's an outsource model or a cloud model, but you're absolutely right. They are true cloud computing and outsourcing in two different models. Because our company right now is moving using Office 365, right. and I've been doing developmental cloud for the last few months. And we have migrated the emails to the cloud environment, actually saving our company a lot of money. Is on, um, paying to the third party vendors, like hosting the emails. And another thing is that um, cloud, like we're doing it with Office 365, which is like Microsoft handling all that. Right. So they are actually taking care of all the server, like infrastructure on the back end, they're doing the back end, like backup for us, and we don't have to do that in, internally. Right. So that's a lot. That's exactly right. Cost saving. So here in this session, you're going to talk about the how companies protect themselves and what can you can protect yourself against in the sense of inadvertent. I mean, getting one of those lovely letters we've all gotten saying somebody lost a laptop with your personal identification and information on it, <laughs> and imagine getting a corporation getting a letter saying ah, our vendor yes. had an inadvertent um, yes. issue. We will we will talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a quick thing. Man. Yeah, absolutely. So, perfect lead into the next slide. 
all of our familiar IT risk supply in the cloud. Unfortunately, uh, no matter what all the marketing spiel say, uh, the risks that we deal with in IT still exist. And then there are a couple that are exacerbated in the cloud. Information security, privacy, as you mentioned, and then vendor locking. Uh, not to say that many of our companies aren't already locked into Microsoft and Apple. It feels a little scary. Um, when it comes to vendor lock-in, three primary concerns, data portability, application portability, infrastructure, and interoperability. In other words, if I go to a cloud vendor, right, if I put my stuff out there, what if I want to move? Right? What if they go bankrupt? What if I don't like them anymore? What if I get a new CEO that says, I hate the cloud, bring everything back in-house? Right? Something, something to keep in mind. This lock-in concern is exacerbated by the fact that a lot of entrants into the cloud are new. They're startups. They're young. And they're going to be around in five years. I think the flip side of this, which people don't think a lot about, but I think it's, it matters just as much, is every big company is now in the cloud. Right? So you may be pretty confident that this company is going to be around in 5 or 10 or 20 years, but are they really going to be investing in the cloud? Or are you going to make a huge investment in some, let's just pick on HP, maybe it's the wrong company to pick on, but you're going to go to HP's cloud uh, service, and five years from now they change strategic direction, and now you've invested all this time, money, effort, and in fact, HP is around, but their cloud services are so uh, lock-in is a concern. When it comes to data, um, did you have a question? No. Sorry. Sorry. Sure. Keep your arms down. <laughs> um, when, when, it, when it comes to data, and, you know, the first point is a funny one, but, but, it's, but it's real. Make sure that your contract says that your data is your data. You would be surprised what the vendor contracts say. If they don't say it, say it, be explicit. It shouldn't be a fight, but you want your contract to say that. Don't. Don't believe that that's just implicit. So in terms of porting your data, whether it's back to you, to another vendor, you know, because you want to run analytics on it, what have you, and then infrastructure as a service solution, it should be pretty straightforward. You're running these applications, you've got logical access to the apps, to the database, everything else. If you've got vendor tools that can help you get your data back, that's even better. But in an infrastructure as a world, data lock-in really shouldn't be so much of a problem. In platform and software as a service, it becomes a little bit more of a complex problem, right? So first, you've got a contract, you've got a contractual right that says, uh, excuse me, you've got a contractual provision that says this is my data. And the second provision you need is one that says, and you will give me my data when I ask for it, right? So second point. Hmm. But the third, in a SaaS and PaaS environment, the third issue is how am I getting that data, right? So it might be my data. They might be committed to giving it to me, and they might give it to me, right? And so. Terrified. I mean, I don't know how big it's going to get, but the point is, right, this big mess of data that's utterly and totally useless to me. So make sure that in, in a PaaS or SaaS environment, you not only have ownership of your data, the vendor's not only obligated to give it to you, but right up front in your contract, it's very clear about how they're going to give it to you and make sure that they're going to give it to you in a way that is actually usable, right? And it may be because you're, you're caught up in litigation. It may be that you want to run analytics. It may be that you decide you want to move somewhere else, whatever it is. Make sure that that data that you get back is something that uh, you can use. Uh, in terms of application portability, infrastructure interoperability, in an infrastructure world, again, uh, infrastructure as a service world, you're, you're running your applications on these servers. There may be some customization, depending on the virtualization layer that the infrastructure as a service provider uses, but it should be pretty easy to move your apps. A uh, couple questions, can you take your VM images with you? Can you not if you don't? Not a huge obstacle, but it's obviously easier to take them with you than have, have to recreate them. Uh, in a platform as a service environment, again, theoretically, it's your application you're running on their platform, but the question really becomes how much customization did you do to get your app to run on this platform? Right? The more customization you do to get in, right, the more customization you're going to have to basically undo to get out and then run on some other platform. And you know, both in an infrastructure and a platform, and even in a, in, in a SaaS environment, lock-in may not keep you out of moving to the cloud. But as you as you go in to uh, as, as you decide to put your app on some platform as a service provider's platform, you want to keep in mind what it's going to take to move, right? So to the extent that you're comfortable with that, that's perfectly fine. You want you want to have your eyes wide open. Software as a service, obviously you're not taking that application anywhere, and that might be fine. Your sales your sales team wants Salesforce going to give them Salesforce. Everybody understands that if you decide five years from now to move away, you're basically starting from scratch, and that may be perfectly fine, but it's something to keep in mind, right? 
in terms of uh, information security. Here, I, in talking about information security and, and also privacy, one of, the, one of the absolute key points, in, in, and we'll talk about kind of how to approach your contract, how to approach your deal, but what's crucial is to keep in mind that certainly when it comes to privacy, when it comes to regulatory obligations, right, whether it's HIPAA or GLB or PCI, whatever it is, and certainly when it comes to your reputation, you can't contract those things away, right? You can't do it. So you can have the best contract in the world, you can perform great audits, but if you pick the wrong <coughs> vendor, or if you pick the right vendor and something happens, it's, it's your name, right? It's your name on the front of the Wall Street, it's, it's your name on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So that's an issue. And that's an issue to be considered when you're considering the use cases, right? Not everything should be going to the cloud. Again, it's probably not something you want to run away from, and you, if you approach it intelligently, and you know the key with information security is making sure that you understand what your use case is. What, what am I? When am I going to put in this cloud vendor's hands, right? Then right up front, as you're considering vendors, you want to understand what kind of information security procedures they have in place. What have they got? You want you want to make sure that your contract actually obligates them to continue to do everything that you are expecting them to do. And finally, the third point, which is a key point, you want to make sure that you actually have audit rights. And you want to follow up with those audit rights so that maybe in six months, maybe every year, you're actually checking in on them, right? That's the best thing you do. You, the be, that's the best you can do, right? In terms of making sure that your stuff is secure, right? Is this the right use case? What kind of, inf what, what kind of infosec protections does the vendor have in place? What kind of audits are they subject to? What kind of auditing am I doing to make sure that they're still doing what they're promising? In terms of the three layers to consider, obviously, infrastructure, application, and data, again, I, it really comes down to what the vendor has control over. So obviously, across the board, the vendor's going to have control over physical security. You're going to be dependent on that. Uh, in, in, in an infrastructure as a service solution, you're going to be controlling the application. You're going to have control over the OS. So you will have you will have to secure, you will have to provide logical security, right? Those doors, I mean, I, in, simplistically, from my non-engineering mind, I think of them as doors, right? You are controlling those doors, you have access to the doors, you're gonna have to secure those doors. Um, in platform as a service, and software as a service, solutions, they should be responsible for securing the entire infrastructure. And when you're talking about application, security, again, in an infrastructure environment, uh, it's entirely up to the, it's entirely up to you to secure that uh, that application. One of the things to keep in mind is the the number of options that you have when you go to a cloud provider, right? So if we're talking about an infrastructure as a service solution, you're running that application, you secure the application. But if you happen to hire the vendor to provide some management overlay, and you now give them the keys to your app, right? Then it makes it somewhat more complicated, right? It, it changes. It changes the kinds of requirements you're going to have to have in place. If you are depending on them and a lot of vendors will sell you security services, well then obviously you, if they're selling you the security services, then you're going to want to have all those requirements in place that require them to secure your application as opposed to you to do it. Um, in terms of platform as a service, again, it, it depends on how uh, it's set up, but you, again, are going to have access to the app, so you're going to have to secure uh, the app from a logical perspective. Software as a service, the vendor, should be fully responsible for securing the app. In terms of data, again, infrastructure as a service, it's up to you to secure your own data, whether you want to encrypt it, depending on what the data is, that's one way to address the issue. But you're, you're gonna be responsible for securing that data unless you're hiring the infrastructure as a service provider to secure it for you. One point to make, um, frankly, with infrastructure platform and SaaS, but certainly with infrastructure, uh, is that the vendor should be responsible for sanitizing their boxes, right? And vendors love to the vendor's response to this tends to be, oh yeah, you know, you're using this, you're using our boxes, and then we'll have another client, and they'll basically just write over your data. That's not really the best way to go, right? Yep. When you say sanitizer uh, boxes, do you mean like, uh, uh, like data dumping or something, or wiping them off, or was it, or was it uh, just recleaning up or just? Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of sort of lost. I'm, I think it means just like. It's like a recycling what's going to be used, getting, uh, getting rid of old data. Exactly. What, what I mean is that when you're no longer using their equipment, they should make your data unrecoverable. Okay. Right. And how they do that, I mean, there are various ways that I'm sure they can do that. And no, I'm I certainly not the person to speak to them. But 
Their preferred method is to not go through that process. Their preferred method is to say, you use it today, someone will use it tomorrow, your, they'll stu their stuff will write over your stuff, and everybody will be happy. We won't be happy. Right. So make sure that your, they actually make your data unrecoverable. It is gone. How, how they delete it, erase it, make it gibberish is... Just make it gone. But it's, it should be gone. It should be something that is, uh, again, in my simple mind, unrecoverable. Um, in terms of platform as a service and software as a service, again, the software as a service, you're going to be fully responsible. Um, platform as a service, again, it's your application. The data is going to be your responsibility. If they're providing storage, then it changes slightly. It depends on what the obligations are with regard to storage. Again, across the board with information security, it depends on who controls those doors. Right? To the extent that you are controlling access to the application, you're going to have to secure it. If the vendor is providing that, then it is going to be their responsibility, but don't assume that they're going to do it. You have to make sure that your contract requires them to, and you want to make sure. You're going to have to make sure that there are uh, processes in place to ensure that they're doing everything that their salesperson promised you. They would certainly do forever and ever because they're the most secure company in the whole universe. Um, in terms of privacy, we touched on this a few minutes ago. You, know, you can delegate away, you can delegate certain responsibility through your contract, but at the end of the day, it is your reputation, and it's your customer data. So uh, go into it thoughtfully, because no matter what your contract says, if it's your data that's lost, you're going to be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, and you know it, it's not going to matter a whole lot to your customers, the fact that you had this cloud provider that lost the data. Um, just like with InfoSec, when it comes to privacy and compliance, what's it's funny, the first step in, in actually getting a vendor to do what they should do is having a structure and processes in place internally with regard to your data, right? If you have regulations that you're going to have to comply with, whether they be HIPAA and healthcare or GLD or PCI, whatever it might be, you should have controls in place that enable you to actually satisfy all those requirements. If you do, then when you put something in the cloud, you just need to map those requirements to the vendor, right? one to one. I used to do this just like you would to an outsourcer. I used to do this, now you've got this app, you've got this data. You need to do that on my behalf. Uh, the experience that, <laughs> that I've had with clients is that when we start talking about this, it turns out their internal processes are a total disaster or they don't have them. Um, I was actually talking to one client, so honey, that you brought up Microsoft Cloud email because we were talking about where they might put it and they said, oh, but we have, we have uh, sites all over the world and I don't know if it's okay to have our data going all over the world. And, and I said to them, well, what do you do today? No, no one had any idea what they did, where their data was, where it went. So uh, it helps to have your house in order. If you do, then when it comes to compliance, when it comes to, to privacy uh, regs that you're going to have to comply with, right? you can map what you've got, what you've got in place, to what the vendor has to do. Yeah. Uh, how does SAS 70 apply to the cloud? Well, I, I don't think all that highly of SAS 70. Uh, period, right? In fact, it's funny you say that because vendors love to say we're SAS 70 compliant. What is that? SAS 70, and I'm sure somebody else who can explain it better than I can, but from my perspective, SAS 70 is, uh, is a report where I show up and I say, I lock my front door in the morning with a key, and then I put a chair behind it, and then I put a table behind it. This is what I do to secure my house, and then someone comes and audits and says, yes, that's exactly what you it's do. Like ISO or some sort and of I, Well, no, that's different, right? So ISO actually has a set of requirements in it. And ISO, being ISO compliant in the various forms of ISO will actually tell you something about the security of this, of this entity. Um, and there are engineers in the room, I'm, some, I'm sure someone can speak to this better than I can. SAS 70 does not. SAS 70, and vendors love to say we're SAS 70 compliant. SAS 70, all SAS 70 does is audits that you do what you say you're going to do. So if you say, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Really, yeah. I mean, it's, so if, if a vendor says to you, yes, we're incredibly secure, we're SAS 70 compliant, that probably means they're not doing a whole lot. Uh, the various ISOs add more to it. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. Is that, so, this is the same way you did. It's, it's, my understanding of SAS 70 is that it's a, it's, it's basically, you, you lay out a process, as, a process and they audit you and say you are following your own processes. Check. Yeah. It sounds like this model. Whereas ISO, what's the 27009, I can't remember what the latest one is, but that actually has a set of requests. That, that would say something more to you about what they are doing to secure their environment. 
Um, last point on the slide, which is an important one. So you have, you have taken a look at the vendor that got fabulous InfoSec. Uh, you have put a bunch of requirements in your contract. You have audit rights, you're checking up on them, but then uh, their lawyer happens to write in the limitation of liability provisions this one line of it says, and we will not be responsible for any lost data. <laughs> happens all the time. Make sure that you do not do all of this work to then have it undermined by some fine print somewhere in the agreement. Obviously, your attorney should, should be uh, finding that for you, but it is important to keep in mind. Um, some, some quick deal tips. I, one of the benefits of going to the cloud, as we talked about, is the fact that you get to use and pay for what you really need. So you should really be staying away from terms. Vendors obviously will try to get you to commit to a term, will try to get you to commit to some revenue spend. When they do, you can remind them that the way they sold you on cloud is the fact that you got to buy it on tap, and that's really kind of not the point. Um, they will try to make it more attractive to you with better pricing, for example. And if, if, you're, if you know your use case well enough, then you may in fact be comfortable with a year commitment. You may in fact be comfortable with some revenue commitment. But make sure that it doesn't actually undermine the elasticity and pay-as-you-go uh, model that brought you into uh, the cloud in the first place. Um, and then again, you know, kind of the, the hidden terms, make sure that there are no hidden termination, that there are no hidden commitments in termination fees. Now, it's a no commitment deal, but if you terminate in the next 24 months, you pay us a million dollars, right? That, that sort of thing, again, the magic of contracting. Um, in terms of pricing models, again, the idea is you're going to pay for what you use, depending on the model. If you're talking about infrastructure as a service, it's going to be a resource cost. You might pay for it per hour, per day, per month. A certain number of virtual boxes, a certain number of physical boxes, certain CPUs, a certain amount of storage. Um, every vendor is going to offer to uh, provide upgraded support, maybe help on the implementation. Obviously, all that uh, would cost you more. Platform as a service is typically going to be per user per month. Again, you can get uh, additional, you can, you can pay more for upgraded support. Uh, you might also pay for, for example, while you're paying per user per month, you might pay more for additional storage, for example, right? You, you get this much storage for your typical user, pay more uh, on a daily basis if you need more storage. Software as a service is typically going to be user of concurrent user per year, per month. Uh, some models like WebEx, you might actually just pay for use. Uh, but there's a lot of flexibility and there's the opportunity to save a lot based on this model, right? You've got rid of the CapEx, now you're just paying OpEx, but that requires that you actually understand what you're using and what you're spending and compare that to what you would have otherwise used and what you would have otherwise spent. Um, SLAs, um, cloud deals are heavily reliant on SLAs. Go back to the outsourcing model, right? One of the benefits of cloud moving away, the cloud as opposed to outsourcing, is outsourcing deals, if you've ever been a part of negotiating one, the documents tend to be hundreds of pages long. And they're hundreds of pages long because, you know, they almost read like a children's book. You know, you will show up at my data center, you will turn the knob to the right, you will take three steps in. You, they are incredibly prescriptive. Everything that the vendor has to do is written out in lengthy detail. The beauty of cloud deals is we don't have to bother with all of that detail, right? It's a service they're providing. How they provide that service is up to them. But that requires a couple things. One, that the service descriptions actually be pretty clear. I can't tell you how many cloud deals I've seen where the service descriptions are either non-existent or absolutely terrible. The salesperson has sold you on something fabulous, contract doesn't say anything about what that is. That's a problem. Make sure your service descriptions are clear. Related to your service descriptions are the SLAs, right? So now they are providing you this set of services. You're not incredibly prescriptive. You don't have hundreds of pages that tell them what to do and how to do it. But you understand that you're getting this service and you understand what it means for the service to fail. And you also understand what happens if it in fact does fail, right? How do you hold the vendor's feet to the fire? SLAs are absolutely key. Um, like other SLAs you're familiar with, obviously system uptime uh, is crucial, incident response resolution. One of the things to keep in mind in cloud deals though, particularly for example, you think about an infrastructure as a service solution, you should also get uptime SLAs against the portals, the tools that you use to actually manage your infrastructure. Right? If, if, you're, if your use case is based on the idea that you're gonna be pulling up servers and taking them down right, every week, depending on what your usage is, and their portal is down for three weeks, 
then even if the underlying services work, you're going to be losing a lot of money. So the services should have SLAs against them. The tools that you use to manage, yes? What's SPI? <laughs> it's, you know, my colleague likes that, SAS, PASS, IS. It's the acronym. Is, I never refer oh, to it, levels. sorry. The SPI framework. Um, service desk performance, if you are depending on the service desk, uh, again, you should have SLAs against it. Um, the next point is, 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 an, is another point that I enjoy. Vendors will love to sell you backup services for your data, right? We will backup all your data, this is what we will charge you. But I, I don't know that I've ever actually seen an SLA against that unless we demand it. What if you don't back it all up? How long is it going to take you to get it back to me when I need it? Right? You're paying for this ongoing, and people typically think of these for DR situations. Well, there should be an SLA against them not getting the data back up the way they were supposed to, or taking three weeks. In fact, I was in a deal recently where they absolutely would not commit to any kind of SLA to getting the data back. It kind of makes everything you paid for, you know, for the last 24 months, for them to back up the data, uh, somewhat less uh, meaningful. You can't get commitments around it. And then service restoration, obviously, uh, if there's a disaster, and again, it just depends on your use case, but if there's something that you are depending on, if you're using an infrastructure as a service solution to replace your data center, you've got key apps running out there, then you want to make sure that the vendor actually has a system in place to get you up and running, right? And one of the, uh, it's, it's not that it's a misunderstanding, but everybody thinks of the cloud as being that, uh, inherently redundant. Right. Amazon had this huge uh, failure earlier this year that showed that actually, depending on how they configure their infrastructure, it may not have that kind of redundancy. So it's, you can't assume that, in fact, because it's in the cloud, it is going to be redundant. Make sure that you've got SLAs against them getting the thing back up uh, if it doesn't work. A couple other SLAs in an infrastructure as a service solution. Again, there should be SLAs against them getting resources up. Yes? Um. In the SLA part, um, what have you seen in real life with respect to uh, recourse? What what do the vendors agree to pay, or that's, if there was a breach? That's a great question. Um, well, a breach. Oh, um, I mean, or SLA, a failure to provide the service. I mean, SLA could be of many kinds. One could be security levels for security. Could be for uptime. Could be for access throughput data. I mean, there's so many things that can so, be SLA. Yes. Yeah, so. Let's take the breach as an example. Okay. Um, I would stay away from SLAs for breach. And the reason is because vendors tend to want to include a provision that says, for my failure to comply with this SLA, you're going to get X, right? Whatever we agree to here is all you get. If they really, if they fail to comply with the InfoSec requirements or privacy requirements of the deal, um, then I'd rather sue them, right? It's going to be hard to come up with a meaningful SLA against them losing all your users' data. So, uh, in terms of other SLAs, you make a great point. It's a slide that's not in the presentation because it's, 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 it's shortened. Um, they can owe you money, right? right? They fail to meet some uptime SLA, they give you $25, right? Or something like that, because that's what they, that's, that, that, those are the sorts of numbers they like. Um, here, here, is, here is a point that you should be pushing on very, very, very hard. The percentage should be very, very, very high. When you've got, I, I mean, in my mind, frankly, when you're buying a cloud service or any other service, and the service is down, right, for multiple hours in a month, when the service is down, you know, I mean, based on standard SLAs, it could be down for half the month, and they still give you, you know, cap out at 10% of your total charges, right? That should be much more equitable. And you have the opportunity when you're negotiating the deal to really push them. How high that percentage gets, how high that cap gets, depends on your leverage. Um, and I've seen various, I've seen various numbers, but it, it, can, it certainly can be hard to push. Now that said, one of the things that, that I always push for, which tends to be more effective, is with an SLA, you know, the remedy, you're not going to end up with a whole lot of dollars, right? It's not going to end up paying you back what, what, it, what the SLA failure is really worth to you. So what tends to be far more effective, in addition to those dollars, is an escalation mechanism. Right. So if you actually build SLAs that say, okay, you know, here's this failure, you know, I get paid X. If there are more than this many failures in a month, then I get paid Y and your VP of such and such 
gets involved and makes sure it doesn't happen again, right? If there's a failure so, so many times in a month, then I get to terminate the agreement and walk away, right? That sort of thing. Escalation tends to, tends to help. Escalation as opposed to dollars tends to help because what you want is for them to feel pain, right? You're not <laughs> gonna get paid, <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's true, you want their attention. You want somebody to care. When they're sending you a check for 25 or 200 or whatever dollar amount it is, it doesn't matter a whole lot. So you get those, you try to drive the cap as high as possible, right, to a point that, it, that it's equitable. You get escalation measures in place, and you also make sure that you define what a chronic failure is, right? Uh, what, what a failure is that enables you to terminate the agreement and walk away. All of those are crucial steps. Now, one of the benefits of, of cloud, of the cloud, is in theory you should not be signing up for a long-term contract, right? So unlike a managed services deal, or an outsourcing that's going to be five years or three years, where you're locked in with this, right? You're embedded with this person no matter what you do. Uh, the nice thing about the cloud is if they really can't, if, it, if they're not up to snuff, you should be able to walk away. Right? And that holding that over their heads is always uh, even even uh, even more powerful than than some SLA. Yes. See, um, I mean, I equate in my mind to a, a lease where you require a tenant or an asset to provide a certificate of insurance and say mm -hmm. that I'm insured against certain risks. Do you see insurance requirements specified and the requirement of a vendor saying I'm insured against, um, you know, uh, because especially as you mentioned, some of these startup companies, some of them yep. may Absolutely. be fairly thin. Um, it is common to see. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And though what's What's uh, really started to, uh, you, those insurance provisions are always in these deals. Now what's, what's developed more recently is insurance that really covers the kind of data loss that would really matter. And so you want to make sure that not only those standard insurance provisions mm -hmm. are in there, but you have provisions that would protect against them, leaving a laptop somewhere right. or what have you. And the benefit of that is that you then also have kind of an audit process from the outside, right? Because if they're really buying that insurance, mm -hmm. then the insurance is buying the underwriting the same thing, okay. right? So yes, absolutely. Good, good question. Yes. Uh, how do you measure and quantify, and who measures and quantifies some of these metrics? For example, application response time, end user satisfaction. Yes. How do you do that? So I, I like that you picked those two. Application response time is the hardest one to structure and measure, and that's gonna be in a software as a service solution, and it's gonna take it's gonna take time and effort to come up with that metric, right? It's not something that's canned. And user satisfaction is more straightforward, and that really is in a SaaS environment. So for example, if you are going to a cloud-based email solution, and the end users are gonna be your customers, you're gonna be your enterprise users, then you can set up a metric that says, you know, every month I'm gonna pull this percentage of people using the service. And if the response rate is X, Y, or Z, then something takes place. And in a SaaS environment, when you really are moving applications to the cloud, where the success of that application and where that works is completely out of your hands, and all the angry users are going to be burning down your door, mm -hmm. that that sort of that sort of process is uh, is one you want to put in place. But it's entirely custom to answer your question. I don't know if that's the question you're looking for. There's nothing can in either of those. Right, you pick you pick two that require you to sit down and, I have and to work through a process. I the user, the organization, as opposed to the, the vendor. vendor doing it for me. You want to trust yes. the vendor? <laughs> Absolutely, the vendor. You should provide the, according to the vendor. You should provide them SLS. In fact, it, it, I was looking at I was looking at uh, an agreement today, and it, it always amazes me how vendor paper. Their obligations, you know, are this long, and then you've got three pages of customer obligations. Um, yes, you are going to have to. You, do you it. cannot re demand the vendor to do measure it. and supply your report every Well, so, sorry, so two different questions. Okay. Right. On the front end, right, to get metrics that you're really happy with, you're going to have to put a lot of work into that. You can ask the vendor to do it, but I've never seen a vendor do it right. Right. I've never seen a vendor do it well because it, it's completely counter to all their incentives. Right. They don't want their feet held to the fire. You want to hold their feet to the fire. So yes, you can ask them. You can push them. Chances are you're not going to get something that's worth a whole lot. In terms of then measurement, which is another great question, yes, it, it's you know most SLAs require that they measure. But if you are going to get if you're going to get the remedies that you really want, you're going to have to be measuring on yourself too. 
because it's the only way for you to hold their feet to the fire. Now, if you have a lot of leverage, you can have a process in place that says, you will measure, I will get a monthly report, right, against these measurements, right, and then I will get SLAs or SLA remedies based on that monthly report. You know, you can put all of that in place, right? But if you don't have some, some sense of measurement on your end, then you won't even know if those reports are accurate, right? And, and amazingly, uh, a lot of vendors have, uh, have an easy time getting numbers wrong when they're to their benefit. But I mean, that's, you know, telecom vendors are famous for this. I was this reminds me of internet, my internet service. Tele telecom vendors are famous for producing bills that are wrong. It's, it's extraordinary. And our clients spend a lot of money, and these are huge mistakes. But what's, ex what's really, really amazing about these bills is that they always seem to favor the vendor. So the algorithm they've got in place to actually make sure the bills are always wrong but favoring them is, it's magic. So if you want it done right and, and you want something that you know, you're going to really use to bang them over the head, it's going to require a lot of your own work. Is there another question? No? I was going to say, I, I think our organization, we just were so small, we we're probably the only exception. Our, our um, telecom vendor underbilled us by a third for over a year and finally caught it. And to their credit, they didn't say pay, try to make us pay back for it. Who is your telecom? It was uh, Cavalier, now yeah, Paytech. There you go. Yeah, that's why they don't want to that. Did they change? Yeah, something happens happen when you get to be as big as 18 team and Verizon. Yeah. Oh, well, you can take a look at the data. Uh, and yes, a couple more SLAs. Infrastructure as a service, again, given that you're Given that you're buying a service because of its elasticity, you also want SLAs against how long it takes them to get a server up and running. Additional CPUs, again, storage. They should be SLAs against all of these metrics. That is why you're buying the service. So when they push back in negotiations, you can remind them that that is the pitch that they got you in the door. I'm buying this because I can get servers up in two hours. Don't tell me there's no metric that actually guarantees that you're going to do that. Otherwise, your pitch is uh, uh, useless. SAS, as you pointed out, application response time, and user satisfaction, these are harder to get, they take more work, but depending on what you're doing in the cloud, it may very well be worth uh, fighting for it. Uh, exit strategies, uh, again, you should have the flexibility to walk away from the agreement. If you're comfortable actually agreeing to a year's term, then make sure that if you decide to walk, that the contract is very clear up front about what you have to pay out if you decide to walk away, that dollar number should be reasonable. Vendors love to take or pay sometimes even more than take or pay somehow, and it's vendor magic. Um, termination for cause, obviously you'll have your standard provisions in the agreement, either party materially breaches, et cetera, et cetera. But what you also want, going back to the SLA question, is a defined critical performance failure, right? So what does it mean for your service to be so bad that I get to walk away, right? That is something that you also want to build in on top of your SLAs. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. what is take or pay that you were saying? Yeah, absolutely. Take or pay is, uh, you'll see in a lot of agreements that you're spending $1,000 a month. And you've got a term of one year, and you can terminate in month six, but you just have to pay them $6,000. So take or pay. So and somehow it can be more you, than that. You pay. There's some, I've seen some formulas where, yes, it's actually more than that. Is that like having a phone contract where you just, if you want to get rid of it, you've got to pay? Something? Well, no, actually, because in a cell phone contract, you have to pay you know, some penalty. You don't have to pay everything you would have paid every month when you use the service. Sometimes you have to pay something. Depending on when you terminate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it just makes sense to run out of the contract. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that, so that's take or pay. Um, and yes, I've seen some funny formulas that get them more than take or pay. Um, post termination rights. It's very easy when you're doing a deal, everybody's happy, everybody's singing kumbaya, this is going to last forever. Uh, it, it may not. So make sure that your contract is very clear about the vendor's obligations to help you move away from them. Should you decide to move, they should be providing tools, they should be committing to help you. You have to do it on the front end. It's not something you want to think about, it's not something you are thinking about, but if you don't get these kinds of commitments in your contract when everybody's happy, you're either not going to get this kind of help or you're going to pay a whole lot for it uh, when you tell the vendor that you are actually leaving. I presume it's, uh, it's not painless to, to migrate from one vendor to the other. I'm sorry, say it again? It's not easy, I presume. It's painful. It, it, it really depends. Technically. Right? And we, we, that's actually, we talked a little bit about that earlier. In a, for example, in a SaaS environment, you're not going to be able to do it. In an infrastructure as a service environment, you should be able to do it 
with a little bit of work and a platform as a service environment, it depends on how much customization you did. But that's exactly one of the things you should consider on the front end, right? Whether or not you want to put somebody, something in someone's cloud will depend on what it's going to take to move it, right? Move it back in house or move it to some other vendor's cloud. Um, interestingly, it's, you know, once things become much more standards based, then it should be a whole lot easier to do that, right? I mean, that is, again, a big sale of the cloud, right? SOA, web services, everything is going to be interchangeable. Amazingly, again, vendors are spending them very little money to uh, make their services standard based and make it easy for you to move away from them. I, more and more so, I think there's going to be more pressure on them to do that. And until that really kind of takes place, I think you're going to see a lot less folks putting things in the cloud because of that lock-in concern, right? So when it is easier to move away from a vendor, you're going to feel more comfortable going to the vendor. That's a work in progress right now. Uh, closing thoughts. I, you know, the first one, the cloud isn't a new technology trend that will pass. I think nowadays people are much more comfortable with the idea that the cloud is, is here to stay. And the reason really is, is that it's not a new technology, right? It's not a hype. I mean, it's certainly overhyped. But it's not a technology, it's just a different way of accessing technology resources we already use. So yes, it's here to stay. Yes, privacy, information security, lock-in, those are all real concerns. You should take them into consideration. Probably shouldn't send you running for the hills. It really depends on the use case. If you approach the cloud uh, thoughtfully, intelligently, there's a lot of value you can get uh, from it. But make sure you do so with a long-term vision. If you are signing contracts, especially with big vendors, while you have the opportunity to kind of dabble, make sure that if you enter into a contract, you've got a longer term vision about what it is that you're doing. Because often companies will sign a contract saying, oh, you know, I'm just going to try it out. I don't, I don't really care. I'll sign their three page form. But if things go well, then you end up doing more and more and more in that cloud. And guess who never, ever, ever goes back and fixes that agreement? And then all of a sudden, you've got much more sensitive data, much more important apps running this cloud. And you've got paper that does not protect you. So, have a long-term vision uh, as you approach the cloud in. Is there any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, from a federal government point of view, um, the latest thing is everybody's going to move to these enterprise solution cloud environments, yes. then client, okay? We want that, okay? So there's this big requirement out there. But what happens usually when you go to the, to the government bogey, they really don't <laughs> know what, what the service descriptions are and where they want specifically and what kind of cloud they want, okay? And, and they're very, uh, they, they don't want to share their status quo sort of operations, right, with the vendor, okay? So they don't, they don't want to share it, A, so we can't help them to decide what the best solution is, okay? So here we are giving them a whole Chinese menu going piece by piece and figuring out what they can do best for them. But then what happens at the end is they don't want to give up any, everything. They want to hoard everything. <laughs> so, so we're going back to square one. And, and do you see that happening, that they want this whole thin client application, virtual design, everything, but then at the end, in the hybrid situation, that the, the hoarding part comes back? Or, or is that? So, so, so who's they? Okay, I can't disclose any. No, no, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure I understood I'm the question. I'm saying they meaning um, the, the customer, the DOD, the government. Oh, the in, the, in that Yeah, case. a different agency, okay. So let's say the FA wants to move into a cloud environment and they have uh, parts of it being hosted, but they, they're just not knowing where to, what parts right. to, to be clouded out. Right. You no, see no. what I mean? So no, no, it's, it's just tearing hairs apart. And they have all these meetings, and they have like two years and three years, and they're back to square one where we started out two years back. Are you in consulting? Or? Yes. Okay. So no names set, set aside, but where are we in, in the environment of, of virtualization in terms of, you know, in the, the big picture? The government moving to the yeah, government. Yeah, the government. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I could tell you why. Yeah. I, I, you I, understand I, if we thought. I understand because when I interned with the USDA in the cyber op in the CIO's office, cloud as we know was, was the big buzzword. And right. they were trying, overall, the issue with what was going on with Obama coming in office and everyone else 
well, not just him, but the overall agencies, period, were trying to, they were basically forced to do less with more. And they were definitely trying to save on data center costs and address PII and yeah. save on it. But what I've come to discover is that, though, at least in the USDA, outside of the CIO, outside of the CIO's office, uh -huh. very few people are technically savvy. They're more policy savvy than anything else. Right. So they don't know exactly what to do. When it's sensitive data, they're like, okay, don't touch it. That, that's common sense. But everything else, they, it's like they don't know technology and its benefits totally. Right, exactly. And when you have someone like me who has a little bit of it, I mean, as far as, I'm, I'm coming as a student intern, and it's like the whole environment is, is very, very risk averse, that, which, which right. is kind of part of the problem anyway. Right. But the people who are savvy are more policy. It's, it's like 90% policy, 10% technology. So the people, it's almost like you had to pull what they, it's like you said, I wouldn't even say Chinese menu, I say more like brain surgery. And, it, and it's, it's not a tumor you're trying to get out. You're trying to get, if the information is wrapped up in a right. pearl. Okay, okay, so going back to your question, where you don't have service descriptions exactly, okay, from the government, okay, that's the thing. But so so what, what should the vendor do in that case when you do not have the re clear requirements? I was actually talking about the vendors don't produce clear service descriptions yeah. in their agreements. Okay. Um, but to try to answer your question, yes, a user of cloud services in the example that you gave, the government needs to understand what their use case is, what they're currently doing, and why and how they would move it to the cloud, right? And so yes, with that kind of mandate, the UK started moving things to the cloud a few years back. The US followed up with saying we're going to do it, and I think the idea is kind of like everybody was outsourcing a few years ago. It's going to save us money. But you know, it's it's a complicated process between here and there. So you, you just ask basically the ultimate consulting question is how do you get requirements, which I don't think is necessarily related to the cloud. I think it's just related to any technology trying to do with a work with a mm -hmm. client is just trying to get requirements. Yeah, but it's not only getting requirements, it's how to facilitate the process of what can we do, right? From a vendor point of view, to give them the Chinese menu in terms of to facilitate the the the, the need, right? To fill the gap. So, you know, I mean where can and that's you know, where what can we do in terms of the vendor to help them, right? Well I mean obviously it helps if you actually understood what they were currently doing. So it's kind right. of hard for you to Right. Help them if you don't understand exactly. what they're doing, and if they don't understand what they're doing, right. it's hard to uh, figure out what their needs might be or how you might satisfy those needs. Right, the status quo operation. I don't, I don't think that's cloud specific. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just you know. general. Yes. Um, kind of along the lines of that question, any of your customers, uh, financial or healthcare, that have like HIPAA or Bizarro, Sarbox rules that don't allow? public cloud and they're forced into private, or is that not a... And they're forced, I'm sorry. They're forced to more of a private or a hybrid? Absolutely, absolutely. So we have a lot of big FI clients, and we used to have them more before they disappeared. Um, <laughs> healthcare clients and hospitality clients. So uh, across the board, and yes, what, what we're seeing is they are tending to dabble in the cloud with things that aren't as sensitive. But no, I mean, big FI clients, I have one of our big financial services clients, still don't think they have Wi-Fi on their ground. I mean, so they tend to be very, very, very conservative. So no, they're not going to put that kind of stuff in a public cloud. Um, some of them are dabbling with private clouds, which is you know, virtualizing their own computing resources. Another thing that we're starting to see is, uh, and I think IBM is doing this, is uh, setting up kind of a, a hybrid, and I need to confuse terms even more, between a private and a public cloud. So potentially developing what is a private cloud that, that can serve three clients. That sort of thing, uh, three clients in the, same, in the same industry with certain requirements in place. But yes, absolutely. So you now it's depending on what it is that they're doing, depending on the sensitivity of the data, depending on the sensitivity of the applications. But is that more law or is that more policy? I'm sorry. Is it more law, like regulation, or is that, say, for the financial guys, is that more we can't do this, or is it we don't want to? Do this? No, no, no. It's it's the latter. It's. Okay. I mean, I think the. I think it's first, uh-oh, what is this? What are the risks? No, we, you know, we, we don't want to do that. What's going to happen to our data? And, you know, 
systems to at risk. So it's it's based on, I mean, I'd say it's based on the regulatory requirements, but, but that's not entirely true because they can still satisfy the REC requirements. Uh, they have certain processes in place. I think it's more a concern that says, kind of what we talked about earlier, if, if this vendor loses my data, then we'll be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. It doesn't matter, right, whether there's a great contract in place or whether I audited them and they look like they were fine. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, for an organization that uses cloud service, cloud service providers to deliver solutions to their clients, do you have any suggestions around uh, negotiating sort of reseller relationships or channel partner relationships between the, the, the vendor and the, the cloud service provider? Yeah, you mean up with the vendor? Or the um, for the vendor talking to, say, a, a, you know, Amazon EC2 or Rackspace about using those in a value-added yes. situation. I mean, I, I mean, I hate to point back, but I think they're the same principles, right? But I, I, a lot of it, though, has to do with what, it, it's funny because you're in a position where what you're really concerned about is what your ultimate customer is going to be concerned about, right? So you don't have to go bang your head against the wall with Amazon to try to get something you're never going to get if that doesn't really matter to your customers. So depending on what solution you're providing, right, depending on the sensitivity of what you're providing, depending on what your customers are going to ask for, uh, that's really what you're going to go after. And then you also have, uh, the benefit of being that vendor in the middle that says, I can't do it, Amazon doesn't do it. <laughs> this is all I can give you. My hands are tough, right? So you're, you're in that position as well. But otherwise, I think the principles are exactly the same. Um, and certainly, you know, you're going to want to watch the kind of liability that you're on the hook for because if you are dependent on Amazon, then a lot of it is out of your control, right? There are some like fails because you got to use one picture that they didn't want to get Or that you can at least cover that, right? And you actually make a great point, which I didn't make, which is when you're buying services, something else to consider is whether you've got that third layer cloud uh, computing provider, because that happens too, right? And you have to make sure that your agreement speaks to that. So I'm getting this great you know, SaaS solution, and it turns out that the SaaS solution is run on someone else's infrastructure as a service solution. What are the requirements in place? What are the obligations, so on and so forth? I mean, uh, how do you, Specify, you simply specify in a contract that they will not or they will identify if they are out Absolutely. Sourcing. For example, because you have requirements that talk about the subcontractors or that you say they can't use subs. You have requirements about where the data is going to be held, where it's going to be processed. But I mean, in a lot of these points, I can see in the size, if you're talking about a major financial institution, right. um, a big corporation getting down and A, having the negotiating leverage to ask these questions yes. and demand and, and get certain things from someone who is desperate for their business or happy to right. accommodate right. Um, a small, medium-sized organization, uh, I tend to think gets told, um, you know, here's the pre-printed three-page form, yes. uh, read it over, and you can get it in white or pink and right. sign them line. That's exactly right. And with some big vendors, you'd be surprised that that's the response they give to some other very big corporations. Oh, I would imagine. So, um, you're right. But I think that, you know, that has a direct impact on use case, right? I mean, so if you're a medium-sized vendor but you've got really sensitive data, then are you willing to do that? Yeah. Can you insure against it? Right. right. Are you going to disclose that to your customers? Are you willing, you know, is, is your model built in such a way so that if you don't do that, you're not going to make money, so you're going to do it and yeah. open pray that you don't blow up, and if you did, well, there it was, right? Mm -hmm. it's not, there's no real way around it. And right. frankly, one of the issues with InfoSec that we're seeing now, even with, even with our clients, even with clients that have leverage, is the big vendors don't want to, uh, you know, open the curtain a whole lot, right? Saying, yeah, we're really, really secure. Show us. No, we can't show you because then we become insecure, right? So that, that that's a fight that that's a fight that even we're having. But you know, all of that affects your use case, right? Any other questions? Yes. Is data storage a main cost driver, like the data migration and the storage? Is that a main cost driver to the whole cost that to be provided? For some. I mean, so we have clients that are storing data in the cloud. I mean, that's that's one particular use case of cloud, but it's it's only one. But is that a main cost consideration for the overall cost being provided? A main cost, a major cost. I, you really, there's so many there's so many different use cases. So it, it depends on what you mean. I mean, some folks, 
It's specific to storage, yes, but no, I don't know anyone that's using infrastructure as a service because they believe they're going to save money on storage. That's that's your question. Yeah. Yeah, no, not, not in that way. I don't think it's for storage, though. It's mainly for performance on cloud because cloud is like sharing resources on there. So. Well, Amazon has a separate storage service right. as a, as a the cloud, so one could. I mean, many, many content providers who have things for download, they tend to keep things there yeah. because, uh, you know, it, it is cost effective. But I don't that, I mean, storage is part of it, it's not main. I think storage is viewed as a big cost control. element anymore in anything that people worry about, oh, is it going to cost to get so much um, storage? It doesn't seem like that. You get buying it from more That by it's is fairly cheap, as I understand as it right. used to be, so I don't think. Are the, are the tools or data available to cost out right. a cloud computing solution for our for our organization? Right. Or do you just have to go to vendors and get quotes? I uh, that's a that's a great question. So I think there are consultants that would be willing to try to help you do that. I think the nice thing about the cloud is that a lot of a lot of the pricing is publicly available. So you could actually run it yourself, right? I think what's what's more difficult and what's, what's absolutely crucial in order to actually save the money you think you're gonna save is to understand your use case, right? So you can get the pricing and you can compare the pricing with various vendors, right? And it's, I would say it's more straightforward than, than you know, pricing applicable in telecom or in other areas that we've had to live with up until now. But what's really complicated is how am I gonna use this cloud solution, right? What is it gonna really cost me? What's gonna cost me is gonna be based on this dollar figure, but even more so is going to be based on how I actually use it, how I use these resources. And because the way that you're buying and using the resources is different than what you're used to, it's that mapping that's it, it reminds me of the thing years ago when CRM and SAP was coming up and saying the cost of implementations, companies, the software itself would be a tiny, tiny fraction right. of the implementation. Right. It was the, uh, the entire exactly. the documentation of the procedures and then mapping and then transitioning and then Customizing and writing things. I mentioned this yeah. implementation of an SAP solution. Yeah. <laughs> Ten years and five hundred million dollars later, it, it, it will work really, really well. <laughs> it's a kind of a chicken and an egg, chicken and the egg conundrum because you have, I want before I can give you a price as a consultant, before I can give you a, how much this is going to cost, I need to gather requirements. But in order for me to gather requirements, you have to pay me. But in order for you to pay me, I need to come up with an SOW. Before I can do that, I need to know what your requirements are, et cetera, ad nauseum. So well, like Roadrunner versus Wally Coyote. The Roadrunner is still running. And no matter how much Wally dies and tries, the Roadrunner is still running away from you. <laughs> and the information you barely can catch. And it's critical information. I like that analogy. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.